It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 281 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 5th of November 2017. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. And on the show today, the discovery of our first interstellar visitor, but not aliens, ancient lentils and the mysterious void in the Great Pyramid of Giza. So let's begin on October 19th. Astronomers using the PanStars-1 telescope saw a small rock hurtling through space, only its movements were a bit unusual. NASA now believes it came from outer space, literally out of our solar system. Lucas, this is the first known detection of a visitor from another solar system. Yeah, exactly. So, that, And that's what's interesting about this is it's long been you know, assumed that we would eventually detect something coming through the solar system that's come from elsewhere. But it's really hard to do. Um, there's one of the biggest problems with, with uh, detecting something coming from outer space is, A, we're not actually watching a large percentage of the sky right now. And PanStars is one of the instruments that we're, we're using to, to look for things. Um, but it actually spotted this object after it had already passed Earth and was on, on its way out. Um, what's really, really unusual about this and, and what makes it a, an even bigger freak event is the fact that the object, which has been very, you know, creatively and personally named A2007U1, um, it, it, uh, it was, it was travelling comparatively incredibly close to the Sun, incredibly close in terms of inside the orbit of Mercury. Now, when you consider the vast distances in the galaxy... Um, you, you consider just how far this object would have travelled. And you also consider that our sun, just like all the other stars, are actually moving around the centre of the galaxy as the, the, the arms basically spin around the, the, the galaxy and also, to some extent, wobbling up and down. For this thing to, to almost hit a bullseye uh, is, is incredible. Uh, you would expect that there's probably lots more things that are passing our solar system, but they'd be way out in the Oort cloud or, mm. you know, in the Kuiper belt or whatever. So, you know, for it to come this close is, is an incredibly unlikely event. But as unlikely as that is, it's more likely than some of the other explanations of where this thing, you know, might have come from. So I guess to, you know, rewind just a little bit, we know that it's come from outside of our solar system because mainly because of the, the orb or the plane that it's on. Its approach angle is all wrong uh, to be something inside our, our solar system. So we know that anything that's orbiting the sun, so things that are, that are within the gravity well of the sun and are, are, are orbiting at a speed and a distance that will keep them gravitationally bound to the sun, we know that um, they, they basically orbit, orbit in ellipses. So we can we can look at those those orbits and we can we can see that it's you know they're elliptical orbits. They might be extremely elongated orbits, um, which are you know things like comets and so forth that would be shooting in and uh, and going out. And their speed changes as they reach different parts of their orbit. So when they go right out to their farthest you know point of their orbit, they uh, they you know the furthest point before they start to fall back in, they're going quite slow. And then when they come in, they, they speed up and they get a real uh, speed boost as they whip around the sun. And that will happen with this object as well. But this object came in at an angle which, which uh, suggests that it's not in um, that sort of orbit. It's not in orbit at all. It's, it's, a, it's a grazing sort of approach to the, to the sun. It'll be bent off uh, in another direction uh, as it passes through, but it's travelling far too fast to actually whip around and end up in uh, the sort of orbit you would expect with something like a comet. So, you know, when it came into the solar system, it was doing around 25 kilometres per second. Uh, after it uh, passed the sun, it was accelerated up to something like 400 kilometres per second as it's then kicked out. So we know it's just too fast. It's too fast to be in, in this position and still maintain a stable orbit. So it will basically be kicked off and, and head off to God knows what in its future. It's really cool because, of course, it means where's it come from? Um, 
we don't know. We've got no way of really finding out. We can we can see the direction it's come from, but that doesn't really tell us all that much because we don't know how long it's been travelling. Um, we know very little about the object itself. It seems to be a rocky object. Um, a comet would tend to be, you know, very um, have a lot of uh, gaseous um, um, venting as it comes in close to the the sun. That that wasn't observed with this at all. So you know, the, the typical comet tail, the coma, uh, hasn't been um, uh, observed in this. So that means that there aren't volatiles on it. There's not gases that will sublimate straight off uh, of the of the um, of the object, so it seems to be rocky. So being rocky, it may have started its life as something that was a little bit more like a comet in another system and was thrown out and then over potentially billions of years of traveling through the galactic voids in between star systems, it would have been blasted by cosmic rays. And uh, I mean, it, <laughs> the, my imagination just goes wild with what this thing could have seen if it were a thing that could see, you know what I mean? Like it's just, <laughs> it's crazy. This is this thing that's, that's oh, yeah. in our neighbourhood right now is something that is from further away than anything else that we know, you know, have ever seen optically. Um, you know, apart from stars, obviously, and stuff like that. But you know what I mean? Anything that we've seen that's a a, a piece of rock, and that's friggin' awesome. I mean, absolutely the, awesome. The scale is immense. I mean, we we keep talking about how space is big, but you know. If it came from the nearest solar system, it would have been 4.3 light years away. And yeah. that is in itself is an incredible distance for something to travel. And it probably wasn't even yes. from that, I would say. It was probably from, you know, 100 right. light years or 1,000. Or well, that's the thing. I mean, even if it came from the closest, the closest to us, um, we're talking about a 50,000-year journey, more, more or less, at the speed that it was doing. Um, but, you know, at, at that time frame, um, the, the Alpha Centauri system wasn't where it is now. Um, you know, not far from where it is, but basically, yeah. So it seems more likely it's come from elsewhere. And, and probably in terms of what could have happened, I've talked about, um, you know, three-body interactions before. And I've talked about the simulator before, which I really, really love, where you can go to a website. I think we shared the link in the past, but you can go to a website and, and play around with orbits of things and see how once you've got more than two things interacting, interacting in an orbit, it's fairly common for one or more of those things to be flung out because it just it's very difficult to maintain a stable orbit in that sort of configuration. There are exceptions, of course. There's, you know, many, many. We reckon probably about half of the stars in the in the, um, in the universe are binaries, um, and uh, so that you know you can end up with binary star systems with planets orbiting those, and then of course there could be moons orbiting the planets and that sort of thing. But you know, it would be uh, you don't tend to see. A planet with a moon and then another moon orbiting the, the moon you know it's just it's not a stable orbit configuration because everything orbits uh, you know in these systems they orbit a common you know center and the you know so that that is just not stable so this this is probably i mean it's we're now in the, the realm of speculation because we really don't know all that much about this object but it's probably something like an asteroid that might have been kicked out from another star system we know that for example in our so we, we um, you know, our, our models, our planetary formation models indicate that in our, when our solar system formed, it would have started as a, as a, a swirling, you know, disk of, of, uh, of gas, um, which would have um, condensed down. And then eventually when the star itself was born, there was enough pressure to, to ignite that process of, of, of um, you know, the nuclear processes that run the sun. It would have then blasted out probably 90% or 99% of the rest of the gaseous material that, that was really that planetary nebula that, that from which it formed. So most of that stuff gets chucked out right at the beginning. But then, of course, you have the planets that are forming around the star. And those planets, one of the characteristics of a planet, one of the things that we use to define a planet, is that they have cleared their own orbit. So, you know, they're, they're, once they settle down and they accrete all of their material and they become a planet, um, they pretty much kick everything else out or everything else collides with them and helps build them up. So, you know, it's that process of kicking things out with these, these orbital interactions, which then would throw this sort of stuff out into space. So we, we reckon that there's probably, you know, a, a, an immeasurable amount of this sort of object in the, in the galaxy floating around between, you know, between star systems. And, of course, we've talked about rogue planets and so forth in the past as well, which are also, you know, um, potentially thrown out in similar, in similar uh, interactions. 
but uh, yeah, I I, uh, I was really excited to see this um, because it's 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 another first, you know, for yeah, for us. Exactly. I think that's interesting. Also, is that as you say that um, throwing out process where things get kicked out of um, solar systems tends to happen relatively early on in a solar system's life. So this is probably mm. a fairly early rock, if you will, that's been thrown out, a snapshot of that time early on in the solar system's life. Yeah. We're big fans of astronomer and writer Phil Plate, and his write-up of this was really, really good. And there's one particular paragraph where he says, you know, if I were an alien race interested in exploring other systems, this is pretty much the sort of path I'd put my probe on. I'd mm. aim it to mm. pass deep within an alien solar system, check out the habitable planets and use the star's gravity to bend the orbit and aim it at the next target. But let me be clear, I am not saying this is an alien spaceship. Uh, <laughs> it's just interesting that it, it follows that path that probably exposes it to the most interesting parts of the solar system. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the other thing is, is I've banged on, you know, over the years quite a lot about the awesome mathematics based largely on, on Kepler's planetary motion laws and Newton's update and Einstein's update later on with, with general relativity that helps us figure out the orbits of things and backtrack and, and go forward as to where things were and where they came from. And, you know, it takes multiple um, observations to, to nail that down. But with the observations that have now occurred for this particular object, with lots and lots of telescopes aimed at it since its discovery, um, we, you know, we have a fairly... A good now bead on on where it's going to and where it came from and one of the early you know hypotheses as to to what might have happened was could this have been flicked in from our own um you know the all cloud region for example by for you know example the uh the the old planet nine you know which is which is, we seem to be hearing about again more and more lately because and we've covered it already on the show a little bit about these, uh, you know, signs from the outer solar system that um, things aren't in what you would expect a stable orbit to, to, to be. Um, things are moving around in, in odd ways, which seem to indicate another, another um, large mass out there. And uh, so, it was, you know, the question was asked, is, this, is it possible that this object was thrown in by such an object in our own solar system? But it would appear that the speed of the object is too too great for that to be the case uh it wouldn't have it wouldn't have been given that much of a kick if it were thrown in and also uh it once again is is even less even less likely than if it were um coming from from elsewhere and threading that eye the needle sort of thing as phil plate said of coming in so close inside the orbit of mercury um, if it was starting from the outer solar system, just the angles that would be required to to achieve, you know, the the velocity, the uh, the shape of its uh, path, and and the, and the um, you know the accuracy of almost hitting the sun mm. are just ridiculously unlikely, even more so than, than what we're seeing. So, it's really special. It's a special thing to see. And you mentioned the speed. So I think when it was detected, it was going at about forty thousand kilometers a second which is very, very fast. But that's obviously had a kick from the sun uh, and the huge gravity well that it got caught into, which means they've tracked it back and it probably would have gone through interstellar space at over 25 kilometres a second, which is still yeah. freaking fast. So yeah, that's really right. Cool. So they, they think that its arrival would have been around, you know, 25 kilometres a second and, and on the way out around 40 kilometres a second. Mm. Um, was, I think you just said 40,000 kilometres a second. Did but, I? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, about 40 kilometres a second. So it, it's it's ridiculously fast. This thing is, is hurtling along. But, yeah, I, again, I, I just – it's just a, a special thing to see and it's probably something we, we won't see again in a hurry. Certainly, you know, something that comes so close to the sun anyway. Ah. Be optimistic. We're, we've got so many eyes on the skies nowadays. We might see things more often. Well, true, but I, th you know, we have way fewer eyes than 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 uh, many think we should have, even just to give oh, us God. enough early warning of, of, of impending doom in in by way of uh, you know asteroids and, and meteors and so forth that might hit us. So this is um, you know, as I mentioned before, this was only seen after it had already passed and was on its way out. So yeah, it's um, it's it's a pretty special event. 
Uh, and as you said, right at you know right at the beginning, that it's, um, it's not aliens. It's very unlikely <laughs> to be aliens unless they built something that looks like a rock, quacks like a dock, a rock rather. <laughs> Oh, that all just went beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not aliens. Yeah. Not aliens, sorry. Well, let's move on to something a little bit more exciting then, shall we, and talk about lentils. <laughs> Penny, have a listen to this. I wonder how many lentils I've ever eaten in my life. <laughs> oh! No, it must be more than that, Viv. Lentils are really good, you know? No matter how many times you have them, they never get boring. Penny, who else never got bored of lentils? Well, apparently the people that used to live in at the prehistoric site of, I think it's pronounced Gurgachia, but I'm not sure, mm -hmm. in Iraqi Kurdistan. So um, this is from a very interesting article in The Guardian about how ancient lentils reveal the origins of social inequality. And I was like, oh, tell me more. <laughs> So this is a site that is, um, it's not particularly flashy. It's not what we sort of imagine when we think of archaeology, you know, amazing mummies, golden statues and so on. Um, the archaeologist who wrote the story says it hasn't got, you know, much except for one small clay figurine of a goat, which is a little bit magnificent. <laughs> and looking not at really. the picture of it, it's not a little that bit flash. magnificent <laughs> is very kind. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. this site is from about um, 4,400 BC or the, the layer that they're, they're talking about and it's an interesting period because it's a time of social transformation from a really more kind of egalitarian society to a society where people are starting to settle down, build permanent settlements and live in a more kind of stratified way where some people... Um, you know, can accumulate wealth and others can't. And this has just always been a personal interest of my own. I found this period in history, this region of the world, fascinating. And even some of the word, the names of the different cultures ring such a vague bell <laughs> from when I studied archaeology at uni. So I think it's Ubayid culture is about a 1,000 years from five, um, 5,300 to 4,300 B.C., and it's when looking at the period, you know, before cities, when people are just starting to settle down with um, year-round agriculture and cultivation. So this site is, or the excavation is, essentially a, a house. It's a, um, a tripartite house. It's made out of, I've got sort of a big central room with little rooms on each side, and it's made out of rammed earth. There's nothing glamorous here. And the most interesting thing about this house is that one of the rooms is just stuffed full of lentils. And this proves something, by the way, that I have always maintained on the show that I know for a fact. Uh, the archaeologist did eat some of the lentils from the Wait, site just really? to see what they tasted like. Yep, for a bet. So, the, But these are over 7,000 years old. Apparently they tasted of dust. Just like modern lentils. Because <laughs> I know, I know, scientists <laughs> will eat. You remember that pork in a pet tradition? Like, oh, and yes. no one in our lab mm -hmm. has ever tried to eat it. I'm like, uh -huh. wink, wink. Uh -huh. <laughs> So apparently in this site, lentils make up about 90% of the botanical material, which is kind of rare because they're a more difficult crop to cultivate. So again, lentils, 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 it's all very interesting. Perhaps, you know, they're an important source of protein in an otherwise blah, blah region. But what I thought was really interesting, no, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, lo I love your passion for this, Penny. <laughs> Now, this is not the bit I'm interested in. That's just the other bit. But what I think is really interesting is that this, this like, large amount of lentils is in a private house. So it's not in a public building. This is not a group of people who are sharing their resources and, you know, hunting and gathering or even tending to crops and pulling in a communal way what they've got. This is in a private house. It didn't belong to everyone. It is a really, really early kind of example of not 
even private status, but private wealth. So I find that really interesting. I think it's interesting that um, lentils, I mean, I guess lentils are kind of like a humorous food in our culture, even though they are and have been a staple for so many people. They're one of the first um, crop foods ever cultivated. Um, and I do confess I love lentil soup. But um, I just find it interesting because I, I usually think of wealth as, you know, gold or some kind mm. of useless thing that everyone agrees is useful because, I mean, I guess it's <laughs> – well, no, you know what I mean. Like, Yeah, Absolutely. Yep. What can you do with gold, really? I mean, nowadays, I guess it's great in circuit boards, but, yeah. you know, it no, looks yeah, nice. Absolutely right. It's the rarity yeah. that makes it valuable, mm. which is why one day it'll be water and, and grain. Mm. Um, again. Well, lentils again, yeah. <laughs> yeah, lentils again. <laughs> well, that's a happy thought. Um, mm. But we are, of Hang course. on to these lentils, son. One day they'll be <laughs> <laughs> But we are sort of basing these assumptions on the uh, social structure based on essentially mm. one sample size. I mean, for all you know, this was just the house of one bastard who just stole everyone else's lentil. <laughs> <laughs> it could you have know? been. It, it would, I think, tie into um, what's – I can't think of any specific sites, but it would tie into what's known about the gradual um, – you know, changes that were taking place in that region in that time period. And because I guess with, with archaeology we also have the advantage of knowing what comes next yeah. is you can kind of look for these precursors. It could have been one bastard, but even the fact that he had a or he or she had a house where they could hide the lentils, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's behaviour that you just couldn't do if you were living in a communal camp. So yep, that's fair. I just, I don't know, I mean... Yeah, for some reason. I think also I found the article written in a particularly engaging way. It is such a good article, isn't it? It's uh, such a good article. Mary Shepperson has done a delightful job on it. It does make me wish, yeah, like that I could write, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, she does start off actually highlighting the geopolitical issues facing yeah. the region. So um, there was a Kurdish independence referendum on 25th of September which meant that all international flights into and out of Iraqi Kurdistan were uh, blocked. So they had to all pack up and bail. And, that, and she says, you know, we really only just needed one more week to get all of our research done and we would have been right. Mm. But instead she was uh, shift off to home to watch Bake Off. So <laughs> more's the pity. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, Lucas, using muon scanning technology... Particle physicists have discovered a hidden void inside the Great Pyramid of Giza. This is a bit exciting. It's a large 30 metre long cavern, but it's not perhaps as incredible and amazing as a lot of the media coverage has suggested, is it? Yeah, I, I mean, when I first saw this headline, I, I was pretty excited to, to read the coverage and and um, it did seem that the the overall trend was to report this as um, an innovative new technology. Um, I, I read a couple of times, you know, sort of uh, this muon detection method and its comparison to using X-rays on humans and and how you know it's a it's a great thing to try and peer into very dense large objects, which it is. Uh, but it's pretty old technique. It's actually been around for quite a while. I, I believe the first documented or one of the first documented um, large scale uses. Uh, was by uh, Eric George to scan uh, a tunnel in the, of the Snowy Mountains in 1954. So it's been it's been around for a while. And in fact, they've used this technique on the pyramids in the 60s, looking for um, you know additional uh, chambers and passages and so forth in the in the Great Pyramids. So you know it has been uh, it has been used before, but uh, you know obviously over time techniques have improved and that sort of thing. So this was actually a part of a, a larger project to try and um, you know, discover more, um, you know, more of the secrets as to how the, the pyramids were built. Obviously, over time, things have evolved quite a lot there with our understanding of how the pyramids were built and certainly about the, the Egyptian um, uh, civilization that, that built them. Uh, and things have changed recently to thinking, well, perhaps it actually wasn't slave labor that was used for these, um, which was really interesting. That was something that sort of came, came has been proposed recently. Uh, but generally speaking, it seems to be 
the, the accepted uh, um, explanation that you know ramps and and you know rolling rocks is, is kind of the the thing rolling rocks on um, on logs and so forth up the ramps and just a really long term project. Um, and if we tried to do it in modern time, it would be probably much much longer and way more over budget than uh, than it was for these guys. <laughs> but in this case, this uh, as I say, this this project's been going for a while, and and and, and it, it is very similar to the. Uh, the process of X-raying uh, that you would be familiar with if you've ever had a medical X-ray. Uh, basically, there's a there's a film that's used to to collect um, the um, uh, the X-ray the X-rays as they pass through the body, and and X-rays will be partially absorbed by bone structures. So the soft tissue they just pass straight through, but the bone structures partially absorbed. So you can you can use that to give you a, a picture, and that's pretty much what's being used here. So muons are. Uh, uh, a particle that are that are um, that are raining down all the time. Actually, they're just part of cosmic rays, and these these muons can then be detected um, by using special special films, and um, so which is similar in a way to how X-ray was discovered in the first place. Actually, when I think of it, um, so they don't have to you know wheel in a great big muon generator because well the universe does does that for us. Um, so we've already got muons coming down and hitting the, the pyramids and everything else, and they're passing through pretty much everything, and it's pretty rare for one of them to actually you know, hit something and interact. But um, it's frequent enough that if you collect these uh, muons for long enough, effectively do a really long exposure, like if you're taking a photograph in the dark, um, you can start to build up a picture. And, and because these muons tend not to interact with rock all that much, but occasionally do, it is something that we can utilise to start to build up a, a picture of the, the inner structure of, of things like pyramids. Go figure. How cool. Um, so that's what they did. And uh, over after collecting um, you know, these muons, uh, exposing the film, over a period of something like two years, I think they, uh, they, they found this, uh, this void back in 2015. So, um, well, sorry, that's when the project started. They found this void fairly recently. But, you know, the... the you know the media being what it is, they want to they want to turn it into, I guess, t- and, and, and tap into all the mythologies surrounding the the pyramids and all the the great mummy stories and the Tutankhamun's curse and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Obviously not in the pyramids. Mm. He was he was not he was in a different area, but um, but you get the idea. We we want to we want that romantic sort of view and, and of discovery. And it seems that uh, in some of the other uh, coverage that I read. Uh, particularly on the uh, Forbes, uh, an article that Ed uh, sent to me, um, that there's been a bit of you know criticism of the of the media about the coverage of this. It, it seems that the um, the void that's discovered is probably fairly routine. It's just part of the building process. It's not like it's a secret chamber. It's not thought you know. It's very unlikely to be a secret chamber containing riches. Is far more likely to be just a part of well saving materials um, if you can exactly yeah yeah. If you it's can, easier to build a hollow structure yeah. than a solid structure full of stone. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think what could be really cool, though, is if they were able to access the void, is we have seen, you know, many times before that the that many of the builders left effectively graffiti inside, and that, that alone has some value if we were to find, you know, mm. some, some more previously undiscovered, unseen graffiti left by by some of the workers, that would be really, really cool because that helps build up a picture of, of what life was like for them back then, which would be which would be very nice. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure if we'll ever get to see inside the void, though. I think that's, there's all sorts of preservation issues that you want to maintain its, um, its current status. You don't want to start drilling through and then sending probes in or something. But Well, it's funny you say probes because there's um, there are um, you know proposals to use um, various robots and so forth to try and to get into some of these crevices and smaller voids and so forth if they can mm. find a pathway through and in a lot of cases there there are potentially pathways that are that are available to get there without having to drill um, whether that's the case for this void is unknown at this point but um, you know still you know technology is always evolving so I think we will continue to learn more about this these sorts of sites Um and it's just kind of pretty cool that the universe can give us a helping hand. <laughs> that's true. All right. And I think that's our show. Go to scienceontop.com slash 281 for all the links to the stories we talked about. Leave us a comment there or on our social media sites. And of course, you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. 
And a big thank you to our Patreon subscribers. Just go to scienceontop.com slash donate to be one of the cool kids and help us out. And thank you as always, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, Ed. This episode was edited while eating a bowl of lentil soup by Marcos Benamou. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. If you understand how the pyramid was built, you will know that inside the pyramid, there is many hollows and many gaps. A, a, a void doesn't mean a room. A void doesn't mean a discovery. What they have been announced today is not a discovery.